Welcome to the penultimate episode of Season 2 of the Ubuntu UK Podcast. It's Friday the 4th of December 2009 and in this episode we're going to have two more interviews from UDS, one with Dustin Kirkland about Ubuntu testing and one with Matthew Helmke about forums, writing books and travelling. We've got a brand new command line love, we've got a bit about Ubuntu or Ecosphere and your feedback. I'm Tony and with me this week, well, Simon's here. Hello. Hello. And we're going to welcome back the travelling duo... That is Alan and Dave. Remember, remember me. Remember you. Yeah. How could we forget? Vaguely. Thank you. Yeah. So, what have you two been up to then, Alan? What have you been up to? Um, a few things actually. UDS, which was the main thing. Oh yeah. That's why we weren't in the last. Yeah. Well, episode. you were. You were in the interviews. Oh yeah, I'm in this one, aren't I? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So UDS, that was fun in Dallas, doing some planning for what's going to happen in the next version of Ubuntu. Mm-hmm. Um, I've done a bit of packaging. Um, well, not a huge amount of packaging, a little bit. Oh, yeah. What have you been packaging? Um, I've In my PPA, I've been really getting into this whole putting things in PPAs. And I've seen a few people um, mention that certain packages aren't in format that they can get as a deb. So I thought, I know, I'll put that in a PPA and then tell them they can get it there. Mm, so one you. of them was um, Inkscape 0.47, um, which isn't in Karmic or Jaunty yet. So I put those in my PPA. And, um, yeah, hopefully that's useful for someone. Lovely. And um, another one was Shell in a Box. Ah, right, yeah. Which is a useful tool that lets you access a remote machine as if you're typing terminal commands, but in a browser, which mm. is quite cool. So if you've only got like web access, you can still get to your machine. Exactly. And get your IRC fix. <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> or whatever you want or, to or use it for. Yeah. What about you then, Dave? Well, uh, same as Alan, I can largely say I've also been doing the UDS stuff. Yeah. Um, but possibly the most exciting thing for myself is... Uh, in a previous episode, I mentioned I w- had a Android-based phone. Oh yes, yes. And uh, I gave uh, two point one a spin. Is that a new version? Yes, yes. It's it's like, this it's... dodgy hooky copy that's floating around. Uh, I no, there is an open source version, of course. Is that the what? But got? Um, on that note, I probably won't comment any further. Okay. Um, but no, <laughs> I can say I, uh, I I'm quite impressed with it. Some okay. The, what's good about it? Uh, well, you can turn the phone when you turn the phone; it changes to landscape. That happens much faster and cleaner, I think. Okay. And the browser is actually awesome compared to the one that's previous. I thought you were going to say you can turn the phone off. <laughs> and that's what's awesome about it. <laughs> so is it faster, better, any, any other yeah, way? Yeah, it seems to be a bit faster, yeah. Yeah, cool. I mean, there's still a few quirks and things, but I think that's a bit expected. But um, I'm quite impressed with it so far. Do you know when it's going to be released as a proper version? Uh, soon. Sometime soon. Yeah. Christmas present, well, maybe. The, well, HTC did say they would be releasing it for the Hero as a Christmas present. So, So you've got your Android phone. Alan's got his. Simon? I'm still on the contract, so uh, I'm just uh, waiting to upgrade. When, when does the contract run out? Nine months. <laughs> oh, that's a long <laughs> time. Uh, whatever. So what have you been up to then? Using new um, new software, actually. Two packages. Oh, I yeah. used uh, Meld. I was talking to you the other day. Yeah. I had something like 60 text documents to compare, so 30 of each document. Nice. <sighs> um, and I used Meld. Uh, and it was really good. The first couple, I um, sort of loaded up and I was scrolling through them not realising that actually it highlights differences. Mm. So the first sort of 10 goes, nothing, scrolling through, scrolling through, and then somewhere differences just popped up. Ah, oh, nice and quick. Yeah. Really, really useful. Very useful tool. It does three-way compares as well. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Nice. Yeah. Is well, it GUI or Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. 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 there's diff for the command line, and yeah. then there's a GUI version. And uh, yeah, I just went for the GUI version. Actually, I'm trying to do that more often. I'm trying to use the GUI now instead of the command line. And it also allows you to copy the changes between the different versions. So each of the changes has got a little arrow by it, which means you can copy it from file A to file B or the other way around. Oh, nice. Yes, a couple of clicks to do that. And the other one is um, VYM, View Your Mind, which is uh, a uh, brainstorming a, a, thing. A mind mapper, um, which is great because obviously I use the whiteboard at work a fair bit and mm. other people want to get copies of what I've done. So, how, how do you find the... Is it quick enough to use? Yeah, very quick. Is it a Java one or is it a Q? It's a cute, isn't it? It's a, it's a cute, I believe. Yeah. And I had a look today to see if... The problem is that it outputs to JPEG. Right. And obviously I'm using Ubuntu. Now, if anybody wants to get hold of the stuff that I produce at work and put it on a Windows box, that's that's the problem. And our media department all use Windows. Right. But apparently somebody's ported it to Windows. Is JPEG not suitable? Yeah, but if somebody else wants to tweak it, Oh, if they uh, want to edit it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so apparently somebody's ported it to Windows. So that's uh, nice. good news. Yeah, yeah excellent. Good yeah, stuff. There's been a few uh, brainstorming apps for Linux that I've tried over the years, and um, they've all been a bit subpar. Oh, this one's good. Oh. Very good. Yeah, good oh. graphics. I have played with it in the past, but yeah, it's all right. 
What have about you just been? Uh, I haven't been doing very much. I had a filling in the week. That was about it. So big sandwich? My... No, no, no. What like a, a, like a big, like a tooth filling in my, in my oh, jaw. Okay. Which means, firstly, my jaw hurts. Um, just because it, it Does was... that mean you won't be talking much? Sadly not. Um, but it was, <laughs> it was right at the back. So it's one of the ones where they had to really kind of force your jaw open for 20 minutes and, and poke around in it. So it's a bit sore. Did you video it? No, oh. I didn't. And um, You did tweet it, though. I, 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 I did tweet it. <laughs> at, at which point lots of people said, oh, are they using open molar? Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, very funny. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but no, it's because uh, the appointment was running somewhat late. For yeah, like, it was yeah. for like half nine or something, weren't yeah, they? <laughs> it was probably the second appointment of the day, and it was already about half an hour late. But um, no, it was all good. So I haven't really done much with computers. More essays. That was about it, really. I'm written, writing my second essay at the moment. I passed the first one. Well really. But yeah, it was good, and that was all done in Open Office. I wonder if we'll publish these. I can do. It's a bit, you know a bit dull if you're not interested in that subject. But yeah, that's about it. No Laura this week. No, she's not here. <laughs> but we, we do have our uh, producer that cannot speak. Yeah. Also known as Laura. <laughs> yeah. She's here waving. No yeah. microphone. No microphone. Should we get on with it then? Yeah. Sounds like a fun pack show. <laughs> <laughs> Thrilling. So it's Alan and Dave, uh, still at UDS. We've got Dustin Kirkland here, who is a friend of the show that we've interviewed previously. You've, you've been uh, demonstrating one of the new projects you've been working on. Um, so tell us a bit about, about what it is. Right, so we are in the uh, very early stages of developing the Lucid Links uh, Ubuntu 10.04 LTS. L- LTS meaning long-term support, of course. Uh, this is a release that we need a lot of uh, testing. Canonical has a plan for really uh, hammering on this release and, and ensuring that we have a, a, a good, stable release. Um, but we're absolutely uh, dependent on our Ubuntu community to help test that. Um, driving that testing is something that um, I was thinking about a couple of weeks ago, uh, myself being a maintainer of uh, KVM, uh, the kernel virtual machine and virtualization in Ubuntu. Um, I, I use it quite a bit, um, but I realize that, that a lot of people are, are not using uh, virtualization. Uh, they, they often um, upgrade to the latest Ubuntu, usually around RC or, or uh, around GA, and that's often too late to provide the feedback that people are very keen to provide. Um, but using virtualization, you can actually run um, inside of a virtual machine basically any Ubuntu release that's ever been, including the release that's currently under development. So I founded this project called Test Drive um, that allows you to test drive, literally test drive, uh, any Ubuntu ISO. Specifically, the ones we're interested in here are the daily builds of the Ubuntu Lucid development track. So using this tool, someone could spark up a virtual machine running the latest version of Lucid, a daily build, and do what with it? What, what, what could they achieve once they've got this, you know, booted up? Right, absolutely. So the, the interesting thing here is that uh, we're going to provide this package in a PPA for, for Karmic, um, and we'll have that package actually in Lucid. But you don't have to upgrade to Lucid to test drive to try out Lucid. In fact, today you can add the test drive PPA on your Karmic desktop and literally click application system tools test drive in Ubuntu ISO. It'll go out to the internet, it'll download the daily build, the current snapshot of what Lucid looks like. And right now Lucid's not that interesting, but it's, it's getting more and more interesting by the day. And now that UDS is over, we can really start making it uh, the, the next release, the 10.04 release. Uh, you click on that, it downloads a, a local copy that's cached. If you've got a previous local copy, it's an incremen- incremental download, so it's pr- quite quick. So if, we, if someone did this a few days in succession, they're not going to be downloading no. a 700 meg no, ISO? No, no. The first time it'll take, it'll take a few minutes, uh, depending upon your internet connection. After that, it's an incremental download, and it, it, may, it, it should take considerably less time than it took that first time. So a, a virtual machine fires up. Um, if, you're using, if, you, if your laptop or your desktop or your system has something called virtualization technology built into your CPU, you can use the preferred virtualization mechanism uh, called KVM. If you don't, Test Drive automatically knows this or detects this and actually launches it in VirtualBox instead. So whether your laptop has virtual extensions or it doesn't, you can do this and Test Drive will, will take care of that for you. As far as I'm concerned, there's, there's no excuse for any user who's running Karmic today, running Ubuntu 9.10 right now or by the time Lucid releases, 
there's no reason why a user running 9.10 can't and shouldn't try out the Lucid release before it releases and provide the feedback on, on things like color schemes and, and interfaces and applications. All of that's totally, totally testable inside of a virtual machine without damaging or, or changing your primary desktop in any way. So if I add um, this test drive PPA to my Karmic desktop, um, do I also then need to install KVM and VirtualBox or one or the other? The, the PPA will actually take care of that for you, um, uh, the, the, the normal package. So if you're, if you're using um, the update manager or the system package selector or the – does the Ubuntu Software Center support PPAs? Uh, I don't believe so, but I mean, okay. we, we can so provide, that, we, can provide we, can, we can link to some notes to do that. Sure, in, in the same way that, that apt-get install of any package pulls down its dependencies, it'll pull down KVM or VirtualBox um, depending upon uh, you know, with what you need. And if someone already has those installed, it's... It doesn't need to download those, right? Okay. This is just a small layer, a couple of scripts that sit on top of your virtualization solution that makes it very easy to launch the daily build, or in fact, any ISO. If you, all you, if you type it from the command line, it's test drive dash U and then a URL to an ISO. And maybe that's an Ubuntu ISO. Maybe it's a Debian ISO. Maybe you're interested in testing a Debian ISO. Um, one of the uh, things about Karmic is there's been quite a lot of feedback, some, some of it negative. And it's possible that we could attribute some of the problems with Karmic with a lack of testing. It's possible. I'm not saying all the problems with Karmic are down to that. Um, and as a result, some people won't have made the jump to Karmic. They might be on Jaunty or an earlier release. Will Test Drive be installable for them as well? Yes. So I have, I have um, PPA packages being built for Hardy, Intrepid, Jaunty, and Karmic. It's going to be easiest to run on Jaunty and Karmic because the version of KVM that, and VirtualBox that's in Jaunty and Karmic is, uh, is more suited to this sort of testing. Uh, for Hardy and Intrepid, I've provided a suitable KVM in the Hardy Backports channel. So for that, we may need to add a couple of instructions. It's a matter of adding Hardy Backports and adding the PPA and then installing Test Drive. It's still not complex, but it's harder than it should be. Importantly, let's look out beyond 10.04 and to the 10.10 and the 10, you know, the, the, the next years of Ubuntu development. Once Test Drive is on your system or is in the Lucid archive, it's, it'll be there. So we should, from now on, have a way of allowing any non-sophisticated Ubuntu user to test drive, to test out, to sniff around the, the current development code. One of the um, things that possibly holds people back is that um, they don't. They don't know what they should be testing. I mean, anyone can boot up a, a daily image and you know poke about the menus. But right. if they're not using it on a regular basis, and if they're not sure exactly what it is they're supposed to be testing, then can they give decent feedback? So how can they know what it is they need to test and what feedback is required and how they give that feedback? Sure. So I mean, take a look. You mentioned the uh, some of the uh, nine that ten reviews that. Uh, weren't universally positive. Um, a, a lot of that was stuff that people found just surprising, and um, you know, it was things like the the, the, the color schemes are too dark. Uh, I don't know. I don't like uh, this color orange or yellow, or the way Software Center is spelled, or something like that. Um, th those are real obvious, uh, easy things that when you upgrade after release, um, perhaps it's a it's a real issue that that we we need to take into account and fix. But when we hear about it for the first time, um, you know, at, at, at release candidate or after release candidate, after general availability, it's just not something that we have the, the power to, to change at that point. So I would say, you know, just scratch your own itch. Try the programs that, that you, uh, you like. Um, as you start hearing about the things we're, we're developing, uh, you guys know that I, I developed the encrypted home directory work. Let's say you've never tried the encrypted home directory. You want to see what that experience is like. Um, you can go through the installer in the virtual machine installed to just a, a sparse image that you can run and, and test and see if it really slows down your, your normal programs, your solitaire or whatever it is, and blow it away when, it's, when you're done. <laughs> so in terms of um, installation, you said that it boots off an ISO. Does it, does it boot with a virtual hard drive attached and you can actually do the installation proper? Right, exactly. So it, uh, it syncs the ISO. So you've got a 700 meg image. So you need to have a little bit of disk space available in your home directory. Um, it also creates what we call a sparse file image. So it creates a disk image that... The file is 256 kilobytes big to start with, so very tiny to start with. And I created such that it can grow all the way to 6 gigs, which is plenty enough to install 
any reasonable Ubuntu desktop. Um, you go through, you get to walk through the, the points of the installer, which is important because, you know, we, we're making install changes, uh, particularly on the server side. Um, in the desktop, you, you get to try the different options. You know, maybe maybe last time you installed with, with, with EXT3 and you want to try out EXT4 or, or um, you know, uh, you want to install a different set of packages or options or enable encrypted home directory and see what that experience is like. Um, so it, you, you are able to do that um, reboot the system as many times as you want, but once you, uh, you shut it down, if you want to save that image, you can copy it off and use that virtual machine again and perhaps test some package upgrades or something like that, but you can also blow it away. It's meant to be, be rather transitory. So do you have some concerns, uh, the fact that people are actually testing this um, in a virtualized environment where they're not av- having access to the real hardware? Uh, I mean, surely there must be um, a worry that people will think it's working and then when they actually go to upgrade properly, it's not, it's not going to work. Yeah, I've got a, actually a little bit of development to do. Some of the feedback that I've gotten so far this week at UDS is people have, have tried out Test Drive. Uh, the concern is that they're going to be testing exclusively in a virtual machine. And it's really not a substitute for, um, for, for, for taking that ISO, put, using USB Creator to put it on a, a USB disk, a USB bootable key, rebooting your laptop or desktop with that and seeing if your peripherals still work. Make sure that your, that your sound works and your wireless adapter works and you know, your webcam and all of that sort of, sort of stuff. It's, it's important that you do that on the real hardware. So testing in the virtual machine, it's really quick. It's really easy. Um, it's great for the sort of interface and the application level stuff. Pretty much any, everything except for uh, kernel device drivers, really. So are you going to try and tie this into USB creator to actually try and do that? I think the way I'm going to handle it, and I'm open to suggestions, but basically you've already downloaded the ISO. You've taken the, the hard part, and, and you've done that already. You've got that cache in the local file. Um, it's, it's easy and really cheap to boot it in a virtual machine and, and play with it and test it out and, and see, see what, what breaks and what works. I think at the end of that, when, once you kill that virtual machine, maybe Test Drive will throw up a prompt which says, You've tested this in a virtual machine that, you know, um, you really need to try this on, on real hardware. Would you like to launch USB Creator right now uh, and make and insert a USB key? You've already got the ISO. You know, it's just a few minutes longer to, to, to put that on a USB stick and reboot. So in terms of testing, they can look at the kinds of uh, things that you've explained, like the user interface changes and test out their applications and that kind of stuff. And in the event that they find a, a bug when an application crashes, they'll get the Apple dialog that will let them submit bug information to Launchpad. But is there, a, is there some kind of coordinated testing effort that, that people could contribute to rather than just randomly testing ISO images? Yeah, so we had a lot of discussions this week with the, uh, with the Canonical uh, QA team and in the, the community uh, testing team. Um, first of all, inside of the live CD and such, you've got AppWord, you've got internet connectivity, uh, at least going out. Um, you, can, you can use that to file your bugs through AppWord should you find something broken in the daily image. Um, after the fact, or, or just in more general, I guess the more general answer to your question, we've discussed trying to tie this into um, to ISO Tracker. Uh, at the very least, the, the the very least we can do is put instructions in ISO Tracker. If you're not familiar with it, it's iso.qa.ubuntu.com. Is that right? Um, at every milestone, and so the Lucid cycle is a little bit different. Where instead of having six alphas, one beta, and one RC for the the Lucid LTS cycle, we're going to have three alphas, two betas. One RC and then GA. Okay, so we're going to try to move to beta a little bit quicker, but try to really ramp up a lot of testing at beta. So feature freeze is going to happen. Then we're going to have two beta candidates. Before we release each of those candidates, and actually after we release those candidates, we really want to to, to throw a barrage of testing at, at a huge community effort. We want as many people trying that out as possible. So. Uh, we can provide some real simple copy and paste instructions. Here's how to launch t- uh, test drive against this ISO. Here's the list of tests we want you to f- to to produce and feedback. And the QA team's looking at ways of sort of incrementing or uh, accounting that with like karma and and showing appreciation for people doing this sort of testing with us. So it's not just a case of booting the ISO up and making seeing if it works okay f- for your requirements. There's also a set of prescribed tests that Absolutely. people can do. Absolutely. So. Um, I, I don't know the 
desktop teams off the top of my head, but the server, we've got a list of uh, 15, 20 different tests that we need people to perform at every milestone. And, and the more tests we get and the more either confirmations if I hit the same bug or I didn't hit that bug helps. And so we've got install the Ubuntu server and, and add a LAMP stack. And so you do that and then you make sure that the, that Apache is running. Um, install the Ubuntu server and install a mail server. You know, make sure you can send and receive mail from this system. Um, that's all really valuable um, efforts that we need help from people. And you know, if if you're if you're a, a developer or a, or a sysadmin, especially from a, a server perspective, and your systems are already running on Hardy uh, 804, I totally understand that. And you know, you, you're you're probably thinking, yeah, I'll upgrade to Lucid, you know, uh, 10.04 eventually you know, maybe June of next year, you know, a couple of months. It, it, the problem is that that's too late if you haven't already sniff tested your applications, your applets, your, your killer, um, you know, do your business services beforehand. So if I understand this right, it's ISO testing is more to do with testing the um, installation process. How, how can this help in terms of upgrades, or can it help in terms of testing the upgrade process? Yeah, so we had, yeah, so, so first you're absolutely right. ISO testing is really about the install experience. Do, do the installation features um, work as expected? Uh, and and are the packages installed and, and running? You know, anything else we can handle with a stable release update or an upgrade, you know, just through the normal, you know, have to get upgrade um, process. Um, as far as working with upgrades, we had some discussions about how we could use KVM and virtualization, even the cloud, EC2, for instance, to uh, deploy hardy LTS 804 servers with some list of packages and then do a live upgrade from 804 to 1004. And in the cloud, you know, we can put a dollar sign on that. You know, that, that costs 10 cents to do, uh, you know, or whatever the number is, 20 cents to do um, an 804 to 1004 upgrade ahead of time and see if any packages fall over on themselves because there's a there's a bug in something you know that's two years of development that's happened between 804 and 1004 some of it upstream some of it by the Ubuntu community there's a lot that we need to, to see in there and it's it's totally doable it's a perfect application for the cloud so people who have deployments of hardy um either as a desktop or as a server. Is there, is there something specific they can do? do? Can they take an image of the desktop or an image of a server backup or something, restore that into a virtual machine or restore that into you know, um, Amazon Cloud and then upgrade that? They, because this is, this is quite a leap. There's been a lot of change between Hardy and what will become 1004. Right. And so there's the potential for you know, quite a few things to go wrong along that path. Yeah, so that's a, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, the term that we use... Um, uh, as developers, is P to V, physical to virtual migration. Um, there are some tools that might help you do that. Ultimately, uh, DD, disk dump, is is the, the way to do it. Um, it. It takes a bit of expertise, I guess. You'd probably want to, um, there's, there's several ways to do it. I would probably boot my server, ideally with a live CD image or live USB image, um, and then I would do a DD disk dump of input file IF equals the source hard drive output file equals somewhere else you know maybe do a mount an nfs mount or something b beforehand but make a, a complete copy of that entire disk that may or may not be practical if your yeah. disk is is terabytes big um, but if it's small um it's something that you could take a, a snapshot just like you said of your of your server and migrate that into a, a disk image and then launch that with kvm and, and and do the upgrade safely and not on your real hardware um less exact science you could create a, a, an image and do an rsync of your of your server into that there's a lot that there's a lot of exceptions there you're going to want a dash dash exclude slash dev slash proc slash right. sys you know but but the focus of iso track uh, iso testing is more for the installation the anyway yes. so that's more of an advanced you would hope if people are running servers with hardy there yeah you know, know actually we we probably need some documentation if it's not there already in the ubuntu wiki for physical to virtual um, migration um if I, I invite your listeners to to help with that project uh you know get in touch with me on irc if you want some pointers but um it's something that i think is important and valuable you think think about how much computers have evolved in the last two years especially with respect to virtualization if you've got a server running hardy or dapper for that matter um 
sit back, uh, step back and think, you know, is, is this workload something that could actually be run in a virtual machine mm-hmm. now? You know, is, yeah. is, is that system underutilized or, or enough to where I could actually m- migrate that to a virtual machine that I can run in the cloud, my local Ubuntu Enterprise cloud uh, out in, in an EC2 or public cloud, or maybe somewhere in, be- in between in just a, a more a simpler um, uh, virtual machine? Well, Thanks very much. And um, what's, the, what's the link if uh, people want to try out the uh, ISO testing tool? Just start at uh, launchpad.net slash test drive. It's time for some news. Sun have released VirtualBox 3.1, which amongst other improvements includes a new feature called teleportation, which allows live migration of a VM from one machine to another. A bit like VMware vMotion. Oh, really? Which does the same sort of thing. Cool. When you say live, how live? Um, I mean, whilst it's running? Yeah. Or? Well, to be honest, none of them have it completely live. You're looking at like, you know, maybe a second or maybe yeah, less you, than that. You, you might time. lose a ping. <laughs> as wow. you're doing it but, but yeah, yeah basically yeah it copies all the RAM over from one machine to another and copies all the system state over from one machine to another and then at the moment it, it goes it just sort of drops the network connection on the first one brings up on the second one um, and kills the, the, the first instance of course you still I would imagine you still need to have shared storage between them yeah you do which yeah. is you know makes it less optimal but yeah, but if you've got a SAN or something that you're running your virtualized environment on, it's good stuff. So I mean, really it's, cool. it's good to see like a, uh, an enterprise feature that's been in VMware for a while getting into uh, into the open source equivalent. Of course, Zen and KVM have had this for a lot longer. They have indeed, yes. Google's bid to take over the internet has gone one step further as they've launched a public DNS service on 8888 and 8844. Those are not phone numbers. Oh, okay. So what's what's DNS then? <laughs> yeah, let's have a conversation about DNS, shall yeah. we? The phone book of the internet. Phone book of the internet, okay. I, I do really know what it is, but I just I would ask. So is this exciting? Well, it's like open DNS, isn't it? Well, like, but one of the major differences is, is open DNS, obviously, if you mistype, will actually have their adverts there. Whereas Google at the moment have said they're not doing that. Right. Yeah? Although I've just done a very highly scientific test whilst I've been sat here. And uh, I did looked up Dig? a uh, yeah I did use Dig and I looked up a domain on OpenDNS and then on Google. Google took nearly a hundred milliseconds longer. I think people who've been testing it from the states have found it much faster than OpenDNS and the other sort of top US ones. Yeah. I've never seen, I've, I've really never seen the point of it other than the the possible additional features you might get from OpenDNS like um, saving you from going to naughty sites or whatever. Is using an external DNS server to my ISP given that. The DNS servers for my ISP are quite nearby, you know, um, mm. network yeah. geographically wise. Is it really faster to use an external one? No, I mean, one of the major reasons is because is a lot of ISPs, DNS servers, are really not that good. In what way? As in either slow or non responsive. Is that the case these days? I, I, people are still commenting that. I don't I've, I've never noticed that. I mean, I've got a 20 meg virgin cable connection, and I don't think I've ever thought. Gosh, this host is taking a long time to resolve. Ever, but maybe it's the sort of thing you don't notice until you try a faster one, and suddenly it's like, Phew. yeah, yeah. But I don't know. I, I look at my web page and I look at how long the page takes to load, and I look at a YouTube video and see the little progress bar taking a long time to go across. But I never think. Yeah, but hang on, you're probably caching them locally anyway. Caching what? Oh, the actual DNS requests, aren't you? Well, I go to no, not if I hit, if I hit stumble upon, for example, I'm going to random yeah. sites that I've never been to before, and yeah, I don't know. yeah. Hmm. Has anybody got any concerns, thoughts about the security aspects? They have said that they're going to analyse all your requests yeah. and, and draw conclusions from it. It's funny. I mean, yeah, I'll, but surely every DNS provider does that. Uh, yeah, but this is Google. Most ISPs don't yeah, but this is Google. Come on, they're the biggest intelligence gathering organisation there is, and now <laughs> they're going to know everything that you do. Says the people who use Google Latitude. <laughs> yeah, well, that's different. <laughs> yeah, that's different. <laughs> I don't yeah. mind people know where I am, but yeah. what I'm doing, all my DNS requests. I'm, I'm a bit less trustworthy of Google's DNS service, to be honest. Yeah, I'm yeah. not going there. Forget it. But the, one, of the, one of the nice things is, is if you don't have a DNS server to hand, it's a very easy one to remember. Just That's four true. eights. See, I, I don't get it. You use Latitude, all your email goes through Google. You use Google Calendar. Yep. So you use every other service that they have. I know. Weird, isn't it? Why is it that their DNS has got me thinking? I think it's because it's lower level. Because they can see stuff. I mean, you could log out of Google 
You could log out of your Gmail, log out of your documents, and you could surf the web and be, in inverted commas, safe in the knowledge that they're not watching you. But if you turn on that DNS thing, they're still watching you, even if you log out of all yeah. that stuff. Is that what it is? Possibly. Mm. I don't think I'm paranoid enough. Nokia have announced that they are only going to release one Linux smartphone next year, but it will include an upgraded version of Mimo. Yeah, apparently there are all sorts of rumours saying they were going to have a loads, a whole range of them out. But I saw rumours that there was going to be an N910 that mm. people were saying, wait, don't buy an N900 ah. because there's already rumours of an N910 next year. It honestly wouldn't surprise me if Nokia are actually a bit disappointed with Mimo as in its uptake because, you know, it's not exactly... Um, one of the most popular platforms for well, smartphones. At the how many smartphones are there that run Mimo? There you go. Exactly. There you go. <laughs> and I, I mean, there's a, I mean, there's a lot of nice features there. But I, I think because it has because it hasn't been adopted by any other manufacturer, I, I, I can't see the project yeah, I mean, lasting the, ni- the, the mileage. N nine hundred was my. I, I was after that phone. I really liked. You the look were of really it. excited about. I that was, one, and then I played with one, and I thought, oh, actually, no, I don't. Almost, it's almost there, isn't it? Yeah, it's almost there. I wonder if um, Android's popularity has actually had an effect. And, and all their plans, yeah. of, they've just shelled them. Forget it. We need to stop developing this. Well, they're also and, reducing uh, their, their range of phones, not just on their... Well, <laughs> they can't really reduce their Mamo range of phones because there's only one. <laughs> but, you know, their they're, they're wide range of Symbian and other, you know, all their other range of phones, they're apparently reducing those as well, cutting back. So I guess it's part of their wider plan to mm. cut back everything. Mm. But it's, it's good to see Linux phones out there still. Well, yeah. Linux, so what have we got? We've got Mamo, Android... Lim, Linmo what's the other one Sharp, Sharps um, hang on what's, what's that one that never quite made it oh Open Moco oh Open Moco okay, okay if you want to count that one <laughs> but then what else is there iPhone and Windows Mobile and Symbian yeah and all the things and then that all the Samsung little, use that, yeah know, specific ones well, yeah. Yeah, I guess you could say iPhone is close I mean you know it's a closed platform and it comes from similar roots to Linux but orders of magnitude more closed Yes, very much so. <laughs> Friends of the show, uh, the Allens at the Open Learning Centre are now partners and official solution providers for VTiger CRM. Anyone looking for an open source CRM solution should give them a call. It looks quite cute, actually. I've never used it, but yeah, it looks quite cool. It's nice to have um, you know another open source project having commercial representation in the UK, all, all to the good in terms of supporting it in the business. Yeah, absolutely. I think they do like a package box you buy with like V-Tiger pre-installed and everything and off you go there you go lovely jubbly well done Alans Camp KDE 2010 is at the <laughs> University of California San Diego from January the 15th to the 22nd as ever FOSDEM will be held on the 6th to 7th of February 2010 at the University of Libra Brussels you will notice that it no longer says Brussels <laughs> I have fixed it are we going to keep saying that all the way <laughs> that's what I'm wondering <laughs> mind <laughs> you we've only got two episodes exactly. left haven't we so. yeah because you know I mean, uh, are you going Jeremy <laughs> <laughs> it's getting a bit old, that one, isn't it? It's that time again. It's time for Command Line Love. A quickie you, this week. What have you got for us? Well, In your a variation box. on the theme. Um, what theme? I was <laughs> <laughs> like The theme of VPS. I was logged into my VPS at work the other day. Oh, yeah. And uh, running Biobu, it told me that there were two people logged in. Ooh. Uh, two. Hang on a minute. Mm. Uh, and I couldn't work out how to tell who was logged in. Okay. Um, so I went straight to command line foo, <laughs> and uh, as you do, and uh, basically came up with W. I thought, nah, hang on, that can't be right. What? W? One letter. One letter. So I typed in W, and actually, it's pretty good. It gives you a list of who's logged in and what process each person is running, uh, which is pretty useful. And it told me that it was me. <laughs> Actually, I had two shells open I didn't realise it that's <laughs> <laughs> personality yeah. and uh, Alan's just mentioned uh, a variation got me last Ooh. which does the same thing only slightly differently yeah it just shows you a retrospective view of everyone who was logged in oh right doesn't play you James last songs then <laughs> no that would be good I'm sure Dave can patch it so <laughs> it could <laughs> Well, the good thing about last is that it gives you the not, username and the host name they came the from the host name they came from oh, right. so if somebody's hacked your password, actually, and you know where you log in from, you can actually tell. I think you've got bigger things to worry about than running last if someone's hacked your machine. On a similar note, I actually had a big panic not too long ago. I've got one server that every so often SSH is in automatically to do stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In the log, it was saying possible break-in attempt and logging, you know, and I'm just like, what? You know, what's this all about? <laughs> 
Well, what it was is the reverse DNS name for the IP address was pointing to a totally different domain name. Basically, the ISP hadn't repointed it to the new one, and it was still held with a different company. And I was having a big panic attack, thinking, who the hell is this? You so, know? basically, were you trying to break into your own server? Well, it, that's what it looked <laughs> like. What it that's what it looked like. But I had a big worry on, because I could see this different host name. I'm thinking, who is this host name? This isn't me. Now, I've had a similar problem recently <laughs> as well. Um, I, I use um, Bittleby, you know, the MSN yeah. thing in IRC. IRC gateway, right? yeah. So, I log on to Bittleby, and I get, I'm on my laptop, and I go, account on, and it logs me into mm-hmm. all the things. And then a couple of minutes later, it goes, you have been logged on from another location. It kicks me out of MSN. I think, oh, no. And I'm thinking, Ugh. racking my brains, thinking, what machines have I ever given my MSN password to? Someone's yeah. logging in as me somewhere. And it's this laptop that I'm sat at. Empathy is logging in in the background. <laughs> but there's no window because on Karmic, you oh, just get the little indicator yeah. icon. So I didn't even know Empathy was logging on mm. as me. I mean, I had configured it. But yeah. And I kept logging in in Bittleby, and every so often it would hoof me out. And I, <laughs> and I only figured it out when I saw someone actually spoke to me, and the little icon in the corner went black, and I clicked on it, and I was like, oh, it's me. Easy to forget, though, that you've configured it. I mean, empathy could log you into yeah. a number of different protocols. If you're an idiot like me, well, yes. If there's no icon, then why would well, you remember? Yeah. But equally, Bittleby's always concerned me a little bit, because that opens up like a, an, an, uh, actually opens up a port, doesn't it, that you, yeah. you connect to, because it's like it's his own fake IRC, IRC server, yeah. isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And, you know, that's always worried me a bit on a public machine. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, IRC's not encrypted. If, if you set empathy up to log you into other services that don't use encrypted login, you could be on an untrusted network, and it goes and tries to log you in, and mm. your, your password's over in clear text. Luckily, I wasn't hacked. It was just me being stupid. Well, but now, so thanks to the default position. W and last, <laughs> we can check up on ourselves making stupid mistakes. <laughs> so I'm here with uh, Matthew Helmke, who's uh, a contributor to the Ubuntu project, um, and uh, we're here at UDS. So tell me, Matthew, um, what are you involved in within the Ubuntu community? My primary focus in the Ubuntu community is on the Forums Council, UbuntuForums.org. And um, I oversee the entire staff along with a couple other, uh, several other forum council members. And we make sure that users who are looking for tech support are able to receive it in an atmosphere that's friendly, that is, um, that gives accurate information, and that is very accepting of people who, whether they are technically proficient or absolute beginners. Um, it's a massive community of users you have on the forums. It's probably one of the biggest individual communities that within the Ubuntu, within Ubuntu. Um, how do you manage that that number of people? Uh, sometimes I think just by magic. Um, the truth is, we have about uh, gosh over eight hundred and fifty thousand registered members. Um, in the last two to three months, on average, you'll see about seventy thousand people have participated in that time. Uh, online at any given moment, it'll be between ten and 15,000, sometimes more, rarely less. Uh, how we manage all of that with a staff of about 35 or 40, um, not counting loco team administrators, um, I think is just because we have laid an incredible foundation. From the beginning, the Ubuntu community um, had a code of conduct. We built upon that and created one that is specific to the forums. And um, there has been an expectation from the beginning that these are the ground rules. And if you participate in this manner, everyone's going to love you and you won't even have to read all the niggly details if you just, you know, treat people well. And you mentioned staff and um, the structure that you have within the forums. Um, how, how will users experience that? They'll, they'll register and then they'll post things and something inflammatory happens or someone says something, you know, incorrect advice or something. How, how is that dealt with and, and what, what levels of structure do you have within the forums to deal with those kind of things? Right. Uh, when any user encounters a problem, whether it's in a post or in a private message, there's a little button that says report post or report message. And they can click that and just type up their impression or their idea of what's gone wrong and that sends an immediate message into a hidden staff only forum where any one of our staff who are online can see it and whoever's online just looks through that list as soon as they get online and we just start dealing with things it's almost like a bug report Um, and so users are generally very quick to notice when there's a problem 
and uh, staff are trained to deal with it in as easy and smooth a manner as possible. That doesn't always happen, so we have a resolution center where occasionally things are overturned, but often it's somebody who's grumpy because they got caught being bad. And when someone does do something bad and you know they're, they're reprimanded in whatever way that, that manifests itself, if they're repeat offenders, I guess they get banned from the forums. Do you have much difficulty with people coming back and re-registering and, you know, ha- is that is that a, a particular problem on the Ubuntu forums because you it's so big and you've got lots of people? Usually not, but uh, it's amusing you'd bring that up today because we had a user who was banned just recently who has today alone created about eight different accounts, and in each of those accounts um, he was actually posting LOL cats or um, really naughty phrases just scattered throughout the forums um, or using usernames that. Uh, are completely inappropriate for something that we intend to be both safe for browsing at work or at school or families, things like that. Um, And what we do is we just watch, and when they come back, as soon as we notice, we ban them. Now, we don't go on a witch hunt, so if somebody gets banned, I probably shouldn't say this, if somebody gets banned and they come back a month later and they register a new account and they behave appropriately the entire time, I really don't care because our entire focus is let's create a community where people can interact in a socially acceptable manner and get help and give help. Um, We try not to be punitive. Our entire goal is to reconcile behavior with the code of conduct. And when that happens, everything runs smoothly. I guess it's tricky. I mean, I remember when I first went, I came online, I'm sure I was a bit of a douche when I was in some online community somewhere. I know hard as it is to believe, but, um, and, and I think if I'd have been banned and banned forever, that, that might have affected my online life. So I can see why, you know, letting someone come back and have a second chance. But, but when you get repeat offenders, you know, it, it, it must kind of um, get you down a bit that you have to deal with these people. And when there's so much more positive stuff other people are doing. It can, and um, most cases where somebody does something like that and they're banned, it's probably a young user, and they come back and they just don't do it again. And then you have those cases, the, the trollish ones, that come back and their posting style is identical to the previous, and the things they complain about are identical to what they complained about previously, and the manner in which they've done it is identical. And so there are times where it's just painfully obvious this person does not want to be teachable. They don't want to be a part of this community. They simply want to manipulate the community. And that's not something we welcome. But on the positive side, you get a huge community. I mean, you were giving me some numbers earlier. When are the kind of peak times of uh, of, um, visitors on the forum? Is it a certain time of day, a certain day of the week, or a certain time in the year when you get more users than others when you're busy with staff staffing duties generally um, as soon as a new beta hits we will start to see the peak and then for the week or maybe two weeks following a release our traffic will increase by 35 40 sometimes 50 percent um, normal traffic patterns on a given day it uh, it depends on where there's daylight in the world uh, this is an English forum so it's places where English is widely spoken. These are our main users. So when it's uh, daytime in India, we'll have a large number of techie people from India who are using English. Um, And uh, when Europe is in daylight, a lot of our users, regardless of what language they speak, deal with uh, Ubuntu-related items in English. Um, But then when it is daylight in the United States, we have a huge rush I think um, I think we'll increase by uh, an average population of four to five thousand that's in addition to whatever the base was and you mentioned that it's predominantly English but you do have localized areas for um, for loco teams for example are they are they um, in different languages and do you do right to left languages and do you support all of that or is it just just English forums? We do support the use of other languages in those loco forums. Each of the loco forums that uh, are officially pr- approved may have a forum created in our forum and we're happy to do that for anyone. There's a process, it's clearly outlined, these guys can find it pretty easily. 
Um, and in those locos, we have an administrator from that team who will read then and uh, understand and be able to respond in the language as appropriate. So the overall forum staff generally have very little to do within those locos unless there's a major issue. Um, so if, if somebody is coming from um, maybe an Arabic-speaking nation and they want some tech support, we have a Tunisia loco, we have other locos in the Arabic language that uh, would welcome their participation and welcome their questions. And it's also a great way to meet some people perhaps locally that you might not otherwise meet because um, even though our loco teams have meetings and they have mailing lists, not everybody knows where to find them and forums are kind of a a base level, entry level place for people who aren't as technologically proficient to look something up on IRC or um, or a, a mailing list or something like that. They do seem quite accessible. I know. I know there are. It's almost siloed. The the IRC uh, community is is kind of one group of people. There is some crossover with mailing lists and then crossover with forums, but you do seem to have the biggest chunk. Um, and I guess that's at least in part because. A lot of people, whilst you've got experts there, a lot of people are, in inverted commas, just users, you know. Um, and and are there any special things you have to do to cater for those people who are, because they're not developers, they're not necessarily deeply technical. Um, are your users um, cognizant of that? And are they, you know, are they making sure that people are, um, are easily helped, you know, when they're um, having difficulties? Very much so. Uh, when you come to the main forum's homepage... UbuntuForums.org. The very first page you'll see a large list of many different subject areas in which you could post. The one at the top that is most easily visible is called Absolute Beginners. You may post on any topic in that section that is tech support related and everyone reading it will presume that you have little to no prior experience and so will attempt to respond uh, in their answers using the least technological uh, responses or the greatest amount of ex uh, explanation and attempted clarity. Um, if you want a more technical answer and you feel you can handle that, then, you know, say you're having a video issue, well, you would go to a video-specific forum and post, and you might post some of your logs or post some of your more technical data and get uh, more precise help. But if you don't even know how to find that or where to start, go to Absolute Beginners. You don't have to know anything. Baseline is, if you can sign up for an account, you can post there. Cool. Um, I, I follow your, uh, your blog, and I, I see um, you talk about um, some of your travels around the world and also some of the, some of the books you've written. I understand you've written a, um, a book, something to do with Morocco, or, uh, and also some Ubuntu-related books. Tell me how you got into um, authoring that, that process. Okay. Well, the first book I wrote um, started because I had been living in Morocco for several years, and I was working in a language school teaching Arabic to foreigners. And then I started a consulting firm to help these foreigners who wanted to do research in Morocco be able to make the connections they needed. And I discovered that many people who learned the Moroccan dialect of Arabic would do so and still have too light of an understanding of culture to be able to say laugh at a joke. And so I collected a bunch of jokes, I transcribed them in Arabic, translated them to English, and then used each one as a springboard to discuss some hidden aspect, hidden to foreigners, aspect of Moroccan culture in a way that um, would be easily digestible for a foreigner. Um, so that was my first book, Humor in Moroccan Culture. Then I wrote a second about Moroccan culture, collecting stories of people's interactions with supernatural events within the country. Um, these are all firsthand from Moroccans, and uh, they describe things like a man who, he and his entire family told me in great detail about how he had been married to a female genie for 20 years and how that transpired and how it was lived out. Um, and so I, I wrote these down and a couple of them were too short so I lengthened them or I changed a couple details so somebody wouldn't get in trouble with their family for having exposed family secrets. So I published it as fiction but everyone who told me a story and had it recorded swore up and down it was absolute truth. They had experienced it themselves. And I didn't talk to insane people. I talked to people that in every other aspect seemed 
completely normal. So how do you tell? How do you how do you spot the crazies from the you know? Well, no one was drooling. No one was you know. <laughs> All of the all of the extreme stereotypes. Right, okay. um, no one talked to themselves. No one had weird tics. They just spoke like you and I do. Right. Um, I, I won't claim that their stories are normative in that society, but I will say that people in that society have heard things like this. And I tried to be respectful. So you can read these and either say, okay, here's a bunch of folklore that people have bought into, or you could also read them from the perspective of the person telling the story and not have them be laughed at. So that's how I got started writing. I just found something interesting to me and I just wrote it down. Um, those, are, those are selling reasonably well. I self-published them. But I'm still selling better than the average self-published. So when you say self-published, that's um, you, you, you have a, an account somewhere and people pay you and you send them a PDF or a book or whatever? What I did is uh, I wrote it myself. I laid it out myself. I designed the covers myself. I owned and still own the ISBN um, and the copyright, and um, I publish them through a print-on-demand company. So if you want to buy it, it's on Amazon or any other bookseller that um, gets current books in print. Um, you can just search for my name, Matthew Helmke. I'm on Amazon. You'll find that and the other books that we're going to talk about. Um, so how did, how did you then get into writing books about Ubuntu? Well, that was pretty cool because um, at that time, some of the people... I've been working in the forum since 2005. And some of my forum compatriots had some opportunities and had some connections. And um, we met some magazine publishers. And they just needed some articles quickly for some Linux magazines. And so I happened to write a couple of articles. That went well. And so I was asked to write a few more for other issues. That went well. And then um, Benjamin Mako Hill contacted me for the third edition of the official Ubuntu book. They needed a, a chapter on a special topic for a special edition of the book that was only sold through Barnes & Noble. And so I talked with him and I wrote a chapter about the forums. And that went well, and working with the publisher, everything was smooth, we enjoyed it. And so when the fourth edition came up, uh, Mako kind of wanted to back out of the process. I mean, he's at MIT, he's a busy guy. Um, working with FSF and everyone else, he's, uh, he's loaded. So um, they asked if I would help with the full edit, and I did. And uh, so for those who were asking, that's how my name got on the cover. Um, I did... I'm, I'm editing myself. I did a large amount of work um, for that for that book. So um, I'm also going to do the next edition this this coming spring based on Lucid, which is why I'm here. I want to know what's going on as well as being able to support people in the forums. Um, as a result of having done that book, uh, one of the other forum council members, Ryan Troy, who's also the head of the forums council, uh, if you look on the forums, his name's Ubuntu Geek. He had an idea for writing a book about software that he works with on a daily basis in his real life job. And so we talked about it. He has the technical expertise and uh, a little bit at the time, you no, know, a lot of intimidation about the publishing process. So I, th I said, well, you know, I'm happy to write up a proposal and help you do this book. So we contacted O'Reilly and um, here we are about a year and a half later, VMware cookbook just came out. Um, if you follow the O'Reilly books, it's, it's the one with the leatherback sea turtle on the cover. So we're pretty pumped about that. Um, and then the same editor that I used at Prentice Hall that uh, I worked with for the official Ubuntu book had a contact in their company with the former editor of a book called Ubuntu Unleashed. You've probably seen it. Uh, the official Ubuntu book is more of an entry-level beginner's book. You can know nothing about Ubuntu or Linux, pick it up, and it has everything you need to get started. So the third edition of that is based on Karmic or Jaunty? Jaunty. And the next one will be based on Lucid, Lucid. throughout next year. Right, right. So I'll be, I'll be active probably in the alphas and betas, testing everything, and we'll finalize the book um, I'll try to finalize it during the release candidate, and then I'll make sure the week of release I'll get all of the last screenshots done and, 
and turn that in. And we're also basing the new edition of Ubuntu Unleashed on uh, Lucid. And are either of those Creative Commons, or are they both, they're both um, uh, proprietary license or whatever? Right. Ubuntu Unleashed is proprietary license. That's just how it was offered to me. Canonical owns the copyright on the official Ubuntu book, and um, it is Creative Commons licensed. I've not seen free PDFs floating around, but if you find one, it is licensed, so you can feel free. And uh, since we're talking about it, my two Morocco books are Creative Commons licensed. And if you can pay for it, I'd really appreciate it. If you can't, you have my blessing. Go to Internet Archive, and you'll find free downloads there. Great. And if you go to my blog at MatthewHelmke.com, not my blog, that's my writing website, MatthewHelmke.com, there's links there. Fantastic. Thanks very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. And now we've got our ecosphere. Should we, I don't know. You, no, you missed see, too many episodes. We've been out of the loop. They've changed the name three or four times since we've been out of the loop. That's the one. Yeah. <laughs> well done. <laughs> did, did I pronounce that correctly? Yep, spot on. Yeah. Yeah. What's first? Okay. Um, I think <laughs> we'll start with Alan. Go. CompuLav have announced a new diminutive Fit PC which squishes a 1.6 gigahertz Atom 4 gig flash drive, SATA hard drive, and Intel GMA 500 into a tiny box. Available in January, price unknown. The Fit PC comes with Windows XP or Ubuntu. Now I've seen the predecessor, the the old version, uh-huh. and it, that's really really good and really solid, solidly built. It's metal case and mm-hmm. yeah, feels. And this is the same size as far as I can tell, but a much beefier spec. It looks great. Well, there's one downside. Hang on. Intel GMA five hundred. That's the Poulsbo non free Intel driver. It definitely, oh, right. it definitely mm. comes with the Windows XP and not Windows seven. It's, that's what it says on the website. Because if you actually look at the URL, choice between seven XP and Ubuntu. Oh, seven XP and Ubuntu. Oh, yeah. Okay, so you can have anything. Um, but yeah, if it's, a, it's anything like half as good as the uh, as the older version, bob bomb. Apart from the Intel driver thing. Yeah, they look quite cute. Is the closed source a driver on Ubuntu? Yeah, so if you choose to sacrifice your freedom, you can still get it to work. Yes, it's in it's in the repository, I think. Okay. Because the the Dell Mini, no, the Dell Mini Ten mm. is a Poulsbo driver thing. It's not one of the ones that has the performance issues, is it? I don't know. I don't know okay. what. No, it's supposed to be quite a good chipset, but it was just Intel licensed it from some other company, Power VR. It's the same chipset that's oh, right. in the N nine hundred. Power Power oh, VR. Right, okay, that thing. The the old version had a DVI output, so it was great. You know, really high quality graphics. Nice. Mm. Tom's Hardware have reviewed and benchmarked Ubuntu 9.10, and it's not good news. Citing numerous f- frustrating... I sounded like a proper announcer there, didn't I? And it's not good news. Uh, citing numerous frustrating installation issues, no. the overall conclusion <laughs> is that users should stick with 9.04, and Canonical should focus on making 10.04 better than 9.10. I think that was probably the plan anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, yeah. let's make it worse. <laughs> yes. Let's throw out everything we just did at UDF. Yeah, I probably didn't word that well, but yeah, the, he, he's not particularly happy about 9.10 at all. He tried installing on lots of different hardware and 64-bit and 32-bit and it was hanging here or there and not installing well so i've still got busted sound oh really still yeah oh. i can't fix it i've given up i've taken my mp3 player into work file a bug diet chromium os is a build of the new os from google it runs on a wide range of hardware and weighs in at only one gigabyte in size so it fits perfectly on that old USB stick you have gathering dust in your drawers. One gigabyte's not that small, considering it's quite a lightweight operating system. Yeah, how many of those have you got gathering dust in your drawers? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I do have a, a half a gig while well, uh, right, gathering okay. dust in my drawers. The drawer. nice thing about this is Chrome is supposed to be targeting specific laptops, and they, what they've done is rebuild Chromium ah. with the driver so it's more generic, and it will run on you know, basically anything. Ah, mm, that's okay. the idea. It's ah. quite cute. And the, I think the build of Chrome that's been kicking around is like a three gig, you know, VMware um, image, whereas this is a bit tinier. So that's why it's, you know, worth noting it's a bit smaller. Uh-huh. And looking at their website, it might have been renamed now. Oh, really? It now looks like it's called Chrome OS Cherry. Cherry? Yeah. I don't know. That's, oh. They've got a nice sort of cherry. Oh, that's logo. nice. It is quite a nice logo, isn't it? It is. It's like a pair of uh, cherries. Cherries. Think. But the Chrome logo is the cherries. Yeah. It's nice. So red. download it, give it a go. Mike Basinger has uh, just tweeted uh, at UPC Plymouth for boot. New handbrake for that work with Karmic. B sides, sound a mailing list talk, command line hate. 
So, um, so first of all, we talk about Plymouth for Boot. Now, mm. th- this is the uh, thing that came out of the Fedora project, wasn't it? For the mm. actual uh, graphical boot up screen, and we decided not to use it. Yeah, we use X Splash and U Splash, yeah. and that's going away. And we're using Plymouth. Now. I mean, so was X Splash and U Splash? As I understand it, were a Ubuntu uh, native project, weren't they? I don't know. Oh. It was obviously perhaps the wrong decision to have not used it. Perhaps, yeah. So they're switching to Bluetooth uh, to, Bluetooth, to Plymouth. Plymouth, yeah. Okay. Next thing he mentions is new handbrake. Here's a new version of handbrake, which is the um, video video conversion thing. Yeah, converter tool kit thing, which is cool. Which is GPL and on Mac and Lin- uh, Windows as well. Yeah, but, but one of the problems is this is it shipped its own FFmpeg and things, wasn't it? Yeah, it's not in the repository, but you can get it from a deb from their website, and it'll work on Karmic. Cool. Oh, so that works. What does he mean by B sides? There's a project called B-Sides. You know how in the old days when you, before, you know, all these kids and their CDs used to buy yeah. vinyl. Yeah, yeah, no. And there was a, a like a bonus track on the B-Side. I've heard of that. Yeah. Tell us about those well, days. Well, there's a... <laughs> well, gather round <laughs> let me tell you a story. Um, so uh, George Castro um, and someone else, I can't remember his name, I apologise, um, have started a project uh, where you install a package called B-Sides. Mm. And the idea is you do that immediately after installing Ubuntu and it gets you all that bonus stuff that you would want anyway. So, you know, loads of applications that didn't make the cut to go on the CD. There's only one of everything. It's not like you're going to get Thunderbird and loads of other mail clients. It's just one of everything Mm. that's quite good that you might also want. Like the GIMP. (laughs) (laughs) So this would give us like an ultimate edition. Yeah, no. Oh, I see. Yeah, okay, that would be good. But B-Sides usually is slightly less good than... Well, they didn't make the cut for yeah. the CD. So, yeah. yeah, arguably, yeah, that is the case. Sound a mailing list talk. Now, the sound a mailing list is the sort of unmoderated or off-topic Ubuntu mailing list? Yeah, it's kind of the equivalent of the IRC channel hash Ubuntu off-topic. But okay. even then, off top, the hash Ubuntu off-topic IRC channel is moderated. But Sounder doesn't, isn't really. Right. It has two, it has two administrators, but right. nobody really moderates the discussion. It's kind so of self-moderating. What's been going on with it? Well, there's been a few complaints that the content is not exactly code of conduct friendly and, right. um, you know, not conducive to a good atmosphere in the Ubuntu community. Well, so, isn't okay. that the point of it? Not really. Um, it was kind of a place for people to talk openly, but there's no need to be, you know, nasty to each other and, and that. So, yeah. no, not really. It, I mean, you can be open without being horrid. Yeah, no, you, you, you disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we just see. You can, but if it's all kicking off in there, obviously it doesn't work properly. Yeah. Well, yeah. There's no, like I said, there's no moderation. So you know, if if it kicks off in hash Ubuntu, then there are operators who who make sure things you know don't go out of hand. But there's nobody making sure the sounder mailing list doesn't get out of hand. Whereas all loco mailing lists generally have someone who looks after that sure. mailing list. Hmm. But nobody seems to be looking after sounder. And the last thing Mike says was command line hate. Yeah. That was an idea myself and Laura came up with in Yeah, we, we put it in, in the last Dallas. episode. Yes. Yeah. Um, and Fab had a, a, a suggestion, Fab from the Lit's Outlaws show, which was to link bin sh with bin bash and then vice versa and then reboot, which I think is probably quite a good way to hose your machine entirely. Yes, yeah, so we had a, a discussion about whether this whole command line hate was a good idea or not. It sounded yeah. like, you know, a bit of fun, but then reading out commands like rm minus rm. Yeah might cause a bit of a problem. Well, it would fit the description of hatred, though, wouldn't it? Yes. You'd hate yourself just after you've typed <laughs> it. Oh, there is actually a, a technical term for uh, that amount of time between pressing enter and realising you had something stupid. I just <laughs> can't remember what it is. Yeah, I can think of a few suggestions, but none of them really broadcastable. <laughs> and that's a wrap for the Bit Bad Ubuntu. Now it's time for your emails, your feedback. Emails, tweets, and d d d dents you know the usual rule of uh, Twitter nicks yep. being hard to pronounce? Well, this person's name is impossible to pronounce. But luckily, their Twitter name is easy. Okay. Tenfil. Oh, I like that. And Tenfil says... Release of kernel 2632. Have you heard of any others with problems with graphics after installing it? Flickering screen, etc. 2632. No. Is that packaged in Ubuntu? Um, I don't know. Yeah. Probably. It'll be the kernel of choice in Lucid... Right. But I don't think it's in Karmic yet. Maybe this person's running... No, it is. No, it is. I'm sure yeah. it is. No, it's 2631 th- in Karmic. Geek fight. Colonel fight. <laughs> yes. No, I think I'll find it. It's pre patch <laughs> 5. <laughs> That's hopefully somebody's now quickly checking. But yeah, I guess um, if you have had problems with 2632 and you have had flickering graphics, send us an email or a tweet or a dent and we'll put you in touch with 10 Phil. Yeah, so uh, actually Lucid is running 2632, I seem to oh. remember. 
Well done, Dave. Oh, welcome to the show. <laughs> Okay. Did, didn't I say that about three minutes ago? Yeah, I think you did. Yeah, I did. Yeah, it is. It's actually confirmed by a man with a laptop. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and uh, Craig Lynch Bloss from New Zealand has written in. Great podcast. I found it through the Twit Network show Net at Night, and I've enjoyed listening to it ever since. I even went back to listen to them from the very beginning in order. Blimey, that's very dedicated. Uh, Craig went on to give us his top tips for upgrading Ubuntu systems after a nightmare of installing Ubuntu and Windows XP. If you have any third-party drivers, disable them before upgrade. Mm -hmm. If you are using encrypted private directory, copy the files to an unencrypted folder or USB before the upgrade. I did not. And now I have 350 megabyte of random noise. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) Handy if you wanted that. Yeah. Take note of all the messages, information, or warning. Mm-hmm. If you get into trouble, ask someone. <laughs> nice. That's like advice you give a five-year-old. <laughs> Actually, it's funny you say that because... Don't I, run with scissors. <laughs> it's funny you say that. I mean, I remember someone who did a first aid course as, a, I think she was a girl guide. And uh, she was told, basically, if you, as a first aider, what you do, if you see someone that needs first aid, the, the thing you go and do is go and get an adult. That's the first course of action. Mm-hmm. To me, having that on a formal first aid course was, I don't know. So that wasn't Craig, that was Dave saying yeah. that, just to clarify. <laughs> thanks for the time and effort, and give my thanks for the podcast to the rest of the team. Go on then, that's us. Thank you, rest of the well, team. Well done, pat on the back all round. Thanks. Well, thanks for your comments, Craig. Um, some useful tips there, uh, especially the encrypted private directory. <laughs> that would be great. I've secured all my data. That It's so secure now, I can't even get into it. Yeah. I use that. <laughs> oh, right. Well, worth yeah, but in mind. of course, um, a, a, another warning is really you should have a backup on a different machine anyway. So if you yeah. did lose that, it's not the end of the world. But you mm. might encrypt your backups. Albert raises an interesting point about upgrades in an email which reads, I keep hearing you compare the fact that Windows XP has been out for years while Ubuntu has a six-month release cycle or a two-year release cycle for LTS. The amazing thing it was with Ubuntu is not just Linux gets an update, but also all the applications. With XP, I expect most people are still running the same applications they installed first day, while Linux distro, you keep getting the latest versions with more features and functionality. Not a bad situation to be compared with the alternative. Actually, this is something which is quite often um, neglected to mention, actually, is the fact that you know you do get upgrades of all of your applications, not just the operating system. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I don't often mention that to people. No. Yeah, it's an upgrade of Ubuntu. You don't say it's an upgrade of the kernel, GNOME, OpenOffice, Firefox, Evolution, Tomboy. Empathy and the little out-of-focus notifications. Then. Probably quicker and easier. Yeah. Well, no, 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 I think, well, I, think, I, think, I, think, I mean, you can, some people would call that the OS, but I mean, the, uh, the things which you install additionally that are in the repositories, you know, you don't have to worry about trying to keep them updated and things. Mm. Yeah, it's a good point you raise. I mean, one of the things that they do in reviews of new distro releases in magazines like Linux Format, they do look at all the other applications that come with it and say, oh, this has had a version upgrade, or this, that, the others there. Um, but we don't tend to do it when we're talking to people about what's new in Ubuntu. We're not, yeah. We don't say, oh, it was a new version of Audacity or whatever it might yeah. be. We talk about notification alerts. Yeah, the new features, not necessarily new yeah. versions, yeah. upgraded versions. Yeah. yeah. Sean Hills wrote to us on the subject of difficulty of upgrades. I have UNR 904 on my Dell Mini 9 notebook. Very netbook, sorry. Very sweet. I now want to try out 910 without doing an in-place upgrade, just in case the Koala breaks stuff. But finding an image file to put on a USB key is hard. Because you guys have a hotline straight into the reasoning of all things canonical, do you know why uh, Ubuntu Netbook Remix is being distributed as an ISO? Do you think you could exert your powerful influence over the release managers to get them to do something a bit more straightforward? Yes, I'm lazy, but Ubuntu should be easy to install, and is if you have a CD-ROM drive. Now he links to a blog post where some guy um, has a bit of a rant about Mm. the fact that it switched from an image file that you DD onto a USB stick and is now, Netbook Remix is now an ISO that you Mm. would put onto a CD or can also put onto a USB stick. But there are positives of the the ISO method because you can use um, U Netbootin or the USB startup disk creator GUI thing. Well, the bloke who blogs complains about that because U Netbootin isn't available for the Mac, which is what he uses. Right. But the fact is he's got a machine running Netbook Remix version 904 so he could use that to yeah. do it so yeah mm. yeah i suppose to co- to telling people to use dd on the command line is not really very user friendly particularly yeah. as you need to sue do it as well and there's a high possibility of getting the device name wrong and, and <laughs> blatting your main yes. hard disk that's partition. true but um i mean additionally uh i'm of the opinion that uh 
CDs and therefore ISOs designed for CDs uh, have a limited lifespan anyway. Uh, I think it won't be too long until we drop the traditional CD and move to u- using pen drives. So I, I think perhaps in the not too distant future, there will be an easier way. I mean, we do have USB Creator yeah. that, that's also been getting some love. One of the things they're looking for adding in this release is the ability to be able to install a server onto a pen drive and actually you have an installation media. So, I mean, I think we are heading that way. But Still I'm, loads of machines that won't boot off USB, though. Yeah, I get what you're saying. That that should be the standard, and you can get a, a non-standard you know, for your old arcade legacy. system. Legacy. Yeah, your legacy system, the legacy um, image, and the up-to-date, put it on a DVD or USB stick image. I, I probably use about three actual physical CDs a year at the moment i still reach for the um ubuntu cd that's on the shelf now and then and chuck that in a machine no the but, only thing i use them for is to give them to other people i, I do not use yeah but you're unusual because you've got pixie boot at home and probably all your machines will boot off a usb stick i'd be willing to bet that there's a significant chunk of people who try ubuntu on not their main machine a secondary machine and that secondary machine may be older and so may not boot off usb stick and who probably don't have pixie boot set up don't have a PC well it's funny set. you say that because actually one of the blueprints i actually put in for lucid is to make it easy to be able to pixie boot um ubuntu uh, on a network mm. um so basically you, you install a package of minimal, minimal configuration you have a boot server that's one of the things i've targeted mm. for lucid that sounds good. optimistic <laughs> yes <laughs> friend of the show and long-time listener matthew daubany wrote just a thought on the whole non-LTS being a dev release thing. If the LTS cycle was to be shortened, would the march of progress be stemmed? Surely if we want to make up ground on Mac OS, Windows, there needs to be some room to grow. There is a huge amount of differences between the LTS releases. Most of the stuff that brings those changes need an unstable release to have them on the most hardware in the most use cases being before they've been wedged into an LTS. Surely having more LTS releases would seem would stem this big time. I might be a bit biased in this, being a more advanced user, i.e. someone not scared to get in there, get their hands dirty and to get something working. But we still have some ground to catch up on the usability and feature sets before we can really set ourselves apart from macOS and Windows to the average user. Just a thought, keep up the good work. It's a fair point. Yeah. If you're doing an LTS every other every other release, are you going to have the time to build all that magic crack that you put in yeah. the ones in between the LTS before an LTS? But, I mean, as it is, I mean, if we would have more LTSs, it, I mean, the burden for that, I mean, as it is, I mean, Dapper is still supported on the server, but it's really not getting the, I mean, it's only really getting security updates. Mm. And, I mean, no no bugs are being fixed, and I, I really wouldn't recommend anyone still runs it. Yeah, but... Not as a not, new install, no, no but... But as a, if you've got an existing box, you yeah. don't necessarily want to have to upgrade. And it's security updates. It was a, it was guaranteed for five years, not oh yeah, new yeah. B- versions but, of um, PHP. Or well, whatever. okay, there are some applications that it's not feasible to do security updates for. Now they're not in main, so technically they're not still in the burden for having security updates. But he's more not talking about security updates. I think he's more talking about inventive new, new stuff, stuff and inventive oh, no, no. stuff. What, yeah. what I'm talking about is the burden to actually support all this. Mm. Yeah. Oh, we see more more LTS releases exactly. means a, a, a longer a burden for more different platforms to keep it up to date. Therefore, mm. detracting even further from the ability to put new stuff into yeah, uh, yeah into, that's a fair uh, point. Uh, new releases. So there's also the point that Laura raised recently, which is that um, perhaps we should have um, non LTS but stable, more stable than they are releases uh, between our LTS releases. At least one between each LTS. But they're not. Is every release surely? I know they're beaters, but when they're, they're released, be- what? Well, but they are. They do have but, beaters, but they are. But when they're released, they are stable. Arguably, yeah, yeah. So if you don't want to, if you want to upgrade, but don't want to be worried by the fact that it might be slightly broken, then just sort of wait a month, wait a couple of weeks, wait six weeks, six months, and get the one after, <laughs> or, or wait two years and get the next LTS. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> Yeah. Okay. I mean, as I've previously said, I mean, um, some key contributors in the server team believe that a non-LTS server release is actually a technology preview, uh, and it's not actually, um, a, you know, what I would consider a stable release by being a technology preview. Well, some would argue that the ones in between LTSs are development releases or bug fix releases, and 
you know, should you focus on making those as rock solid and stable when in fact you've got a target which is in two releases time something that's supposed to be super stable the yeah. LTS well I think a lot of this comes down to is the actual QA and uh, I think the QA team has been constantly overworked and I think now this release there's a big focus on extra community involvement in actually testing yeah so um, I mean more testing means more bugs means more fixing Albert wrote to ask I was thinking as the podcast is mainly focused on the desktop users, so it would be good to have some interviews uh, with users. Uh, this could be a good way to open it up to the listeners, any of them doing interesting things that they would be happy to talk about. Other than that, I've listened to all the podcasts and look forward to each one. I must also admit that this is the first that I've listened to the Odd Camp Raffle and found it enjoyable. <laughs> Another person who's a fan of, of cheap prize draws on radio. <laughs> <laughs> Albert goes on to answer some of those questions himself as the first contributor to such a section. So what do you think? Should we have a section in the next season where we ask people what they do with Ubuntu? Yeah, it sounds like an interesting idea to me, but it's up to everybody who's listening to you know say whether they're up for telling us a bit about how they use Ubuntu, I guess. Yeah. If, I mean, Albert came up with a bunch of questions, yeah, like you know, five questions we could ask people and... You know, maybe like a mini interview for users mm. and see what they do. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we have actually previously considered this. I mean, we did and go through a stage of considering basically having a live uh, release, and we did think about perhaps having people actually phone in to actually, you know, we could actually talk to just mm. normal users. Um, but, but I think this is a bit different because it's not it's not about quizzing people. It's more about just you know you know like those stupid quizzes you see on um, like Facebook and that you know, five questions. Oh, we just love like, them. Just. You know, five simple questions that, and you ask the same five questions of all the people, and and see what different answers yeah. you get. You know, I mean, people, that that's certainly something we could certain. I mean, we're always welcoming feedback and things on yeah. the. Uh, so if people like the idea of that, then um, yeah, yeah, let's know and let's know what kind of questions you think should be in that list of five. Luke Platypus wrote in a frenzy of capital letters and excessive punctuation. I think it is high time that people started to understand and use netbooks for what they were designed and built for for using the internet, full stop. And that's why I think the Chrome OS is the way to go. When the first EPC came out with Linux on them, they had a simplified front end to do just this, and they worked great for doing that job, surfing, email, web stuff. But then some donkeys wanted to put Windows on them, and and then the Linux started losing the battle. Please, 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 people, they are designed to be a long-lasting, simple web machine. That's why I think the Google Chrome OS will be great. I have heard on a couple of podcasts reports saying that it is in fact Ubuntu under the hood with a Google GUI on top. And as for not being able to add more apps, I think this is a good thing. Back to before, as I said, it's not just it is just for web stuff. So no need to run other apps and make it run doggish. This way it will run and run. Luke adds. P.S. I am still getting incorrect timestamps on the high MP3 file when I play it on my fifth generation iPod video. But if I play it from Gpod into VLC, I get the correct timestamp. It's about 18 to 20 minutes extra on the iPod. Is that our uh, our secret part we, we add yeah. to the episode? That's the bonus we give for the <laughs> iTunes users. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Joke. The, 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 uh, the OG listeners don't get to hear that special added content. No, that's right. It's only Dir- for freedom haters. Director's cut. We just, we just play the free software song eight times at the end of the episode <laughs> <laughs> to drive people to use the OG version instead. <laughs> we should do that. We should so do that. Actually, just slip it in at various points throughout the throughout the episode. <laughs> the thing is, we'll likely be disappointed because whatever large proportion of our listeners don't actually listen all the way through, and we might not. <laughs> nobody would complain. Yeah, um, yeah. I think the timestamp thing is um, the, it is something to do with iPod and the way that they use the uh, variable bit rate files. And they, yeah, I wouldn't worry about it. Just use a proper use GPod and VLC instead. Um, but yeah, in terms of the uh, netbooks thing and his his big rant about that. Um, it's a good point. Mm. Um, yeah, people do try and get more and more out of these things. And I sit there with mine sometimes <laughs> going, oh, it doesn't run OpenOffice in press very well. <laughs> well, well yeah, I mean, the, the original EPC that came with Xandros, it, the front screen of it was all web apps. It was like Google Mail, Google this, mm. you know, loads of online stuff. And then if you looked on the other tabs, there are a few locally installed applications. And there was OpenOffice and, and stuff. But <laughs> it really was, you know use this as a web thing and it had the Wi-Fi worked and internet worked and, and 3G dongles worked. So it was designed to be online. And do you think the focus has been lost with people using XP on them and things? Because you can only really use XP for, for local applications, pretty much. Really? You can run Chrome on XP. Yeah, but you've got all the overhead of running XP. Yeah. And oh, installing updates. the resources and, and things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because, yeah. yeah, I mean, I've seen any running XP and it's not particularly fast. Really? 
especially compared to compare that to the netbook remix see on my e900 now i've trimmed it right down i've got ubuntu 904 trimmed it right down got rid of all the local apps pretty much so you know effectively running chrome um and i've put chrome the browser on top of it and that's all i use it for full screen browser full screen terminal and that's all it works fine mm. so yeah he has a point mm. finally on identica we noticed friend of the show and forum guru mike basiger wrote to report that he'd stopped listening to this week in tech and instead listened to in his words some sanity from the uupc folks thanks mike uh, thank you mike yes excellent entirely appropriate mm. and that's all your feedback <laughs> Thanks for listening, and thanks to everyone who took part via Twitter and Identica. If you'd like to get hold of us, you can email the show via podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can leave us a voicemail in a number of ways. Telephone 0845 508 1986 or VoIP podcast at sip.ubuntu-uk.org. And finally, Skype us on Ubuntu UK podcast. You can send us your comments and get updates from recording sessions on Identica or Twitter, where we are at UUPC. Alternatively, if you're into IRC, you can chat to us on the Freenode network in hash ubuntu-uk-podcast channel. Join our Facebook fan page, search for Ubuntu UK Podcast. We welcome just a moment. We haven't had just a moment for ages, have we? Command line loves, reviews or rants and feedback, both positive and negative. Please do get in touch. And thank you also to our network of community mirrors listed on the website. See you next time. See you next time for our last episode of season two. Ever. Ooh. Of season two. Ever. <laughs> Join us next time for a very special episode. Bye.